I'm Clive Beale. I'm the uh, Director of Educational Development for Raspberry Pi, Pi Foundation. Till about three weeks ago, I was a teacher. I'm still doing some teaching at the moment. So um, I've been working with the Foundation for about 18, 18 months or so, from quite, quite early on, um, working on the forums, blogging for them, um, and just generally getting, invo getting involved with them. So recently, we had uh, a grant from Google to give away a large amount of Raspberry Pis to, um, t well, to young people basically, not to schools specifically, and also to do outreach and to develop resources um, for education. And so I'm managing that project and also doing outreach at schools, um, CPD, and just really generally be involved in the whole educational thing. So it's great because we're an educational charity, and so it's really nice to get back to our roots and to have the resources and time and money finally to really get back to what we, we believe and we're, we're passionate about, which is uh, education and to get young people. And in fact, it's moved beyond young people, but just to get people into computing, get them passionate and get them playing and creating. So. I'll stand up. This is bringing out the teacher in me. Um, I'm at Chris underscore Swan. Yes, that's who I am. Um, I'm a full-time teacher, uh, head of department. I work in a secondary school in the Midlands in a place called Stourport on Seven, which not many people have actually heard of. Um, but it's a great place to, to work. Uh, there's a lot going on in the Midlands. I think we love to call it Silicon Stourport. There's so much going on. Uh, I'm originally a Londoner, so it's quite far north for me. And what can I say about my career? Well, I started out as a biologist, always had an interest in computers. My mum used to be a computer operator. And I decided I got sick of cutting up animals. So I decided when my kids were very small that I was going to go back and do another degree. And I suddenly found there were a whole range of skills that I really was quite good at. Um, and I got my Cisco networking qualification. Uh, I got myself a job in an FEHE college. I was head of computing for 12 years, and then they made me redundant. Uh, went back into school and suddenly found that computing was really happening. I love my job. I love going into work every day. I never know what's going to happen. Um, my kids come up with crazy ideas of things that they want to do as projects. The Raspberry Pi has just opened so many doors to students and so many new skills. It's a fantastic learning resource. There you see, I've pitched it to you already. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the panel discussion. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Vicky Dodds. I'm a teacher of ICT and computing at Ashton Community Science College in Preston. I'm a close colleague of Alan O'Donoghue who ropes me into absolutely everything he possibly can at very short notice generally. Um, I'm here really, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't use the Raspberry Pi in school at the moment. I don't, um, we haven't got the resources in school to purchase them for class sets or, or for our students. Um, and our, our, my students have seen them, they've experienced them through me bringing them in, my own, um, and they want to see more of it. It excites them because they can see that it hasn't got a nice shiny shell and they can't believe that such a small thing can do so much. And I'm actually wanting to bring it into education more because I'm being asked to by my students. Um, that's about it, really. Hi. Uh, I am uh, Karin Andersson, and I come from Sweden. And I will start the uh, Raspberry Jam in uh, Helsingborg. It's the south part of Sweden in the uh, 13th of April. So we are a little after you. Um, and we do it because we found Raspberry Pi so nice and there's so much to learn about Raspberry Pi. And uh, it's just a start. I can say it's just a start. And that, that's great. Kar Karin was came from Sweden yesterday and she was telling me that in Sweden they have clubs for everything, no matter what you do, whether it's snooker or skiing or collecting stamps, there's clubs. But there's no clubs for Raspberry Pi in Sweden. But yet, Raspberry Pi, there's, there's lots of them get shipped over there. So Karen's come over here with a mission. She wants to set up Raspberry Jams in Sweden. And she's hoping this is going to help us. So we're going to direct some questions now to our panel. And I'm looking to see if any of... I haven't seen any come through yet on Twitter. So just for the moment, we'll pick up ones from the audience. So anybody who's got a question in the audience about the educational value of the Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to go over to... 
Duncan, so. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Duncan Hull. I'm, I work at University of Manchester in the Computer Science Department. Um, I have a question uh, about the Raspberry Pi, which is, going forward, I know there's lots of interesting things happening in the education space. Um, the, the Raspberry Pis I see at the moment have got primarily into the hands of, of geeks, and I know this is something that the Raspberry Pi Foundation is addressing. So how, how do we ensure that, that, that more of them get into classrooms and... How, how you know what? What do you think are the key things that need to happen? I was asked if uh, my students could buy them through the school, um, and that would allow them to buy them VAT free for educational purposes. And I'd actually, I approached my finance director and actually asked if we could do that. And I was faced with a wall, a, a wall of bu bureaucracy, to be honest. But my students want them, and we. I think the schools have a responsibility or should step in really to provide them where needed or where, where wanted and allow students to buy them either through, buy them through the school or provided by the Raspberry Foundation through the Google to the students that want to use them and then we can perhaps set our clubs up. Um, I also think that some schools get a bit scared because hold on, should we put these things on a network um, and allow network access and I think, I think no, but I think as schools as a teacher, I'd like to be able to provide them to my students, let them buy them through us and let us set the clubs up to teach them how to use them. Yeah, I, um, <coughs> it's a huge question really because uh, as well, it's not even a Raspberry Pi specific, is it, is it the, um, the curriculum's changing and um, we're part of that. And so CPD is going to be like a huge, huge thing. We want, well, we are part of that. We will continue to be part of that. But really, I think it is down to um, showing teachers that this is a very useful tool. It won't replace your PCs. It's not intended to. It's a complement to your existing setup. And that um, it's not scary. So it is quite a unique thing. If, you, if all you've ever seen is this closed box system uh, of a PC sitting on your desk that boots up to a desktop, then it can actually be quite intimidating to see this little computer which, which boots to a command line and sort of sits there and, and asks you to tell it what to do. And then what we need to do is to do outreach and CPD and resources which, which will allow teachers to see that actually that's a very powerful thing to have the computer ask you what to do because it's the start of a learning process. And so one of the things we'll be doing this year is, is to make sure we're getting those resources in place, putting them somewhere central where teachers can actually access them and um, to show what you can do with the Pi, how to get started really easily, and, and, and moreover to give you little um, pre-built packs that you can use in your classroom and get started and just pick that up and, and do some really good um, computer science. Um, and have fun in the classroom and actually do creative, um, creative stuff with the Raspberry Pi. So. But it's a, it's a, it's a pretty profound, it's a profound question. Yeah. I've just got one thing to add, and that is budget. Um, my budget's so restricted that to find something that's very cost effective and so flexible as the Pi is, that I can use it in so many different ways for so many different activities. And I can even use it in classrooms where there aren't computers. And that I think is really exciting. So we've got, a, we've got a question now that's come through on Twitter from Pi Maroney. This is a name that Pi fans will have heard of, well known for making the Pi bow. Um, they're asking, how can we help more teachers be happy with hardware without lessons becoming rote? So rote when it, we're teaching things over and over and over again. So how can we do that? Make it fun. <laughs> and how? <laughs> Make it silly. Well, we've got the singing, um, I have to say singing jelly babies um, on the OCR stand. If you've picked up your pack already, um, we can, oh yes, there we go. Here we are demonstration pack if you haven't picked one up yet go and get one before you leave today um so we can do rob don't hide we can actually do simple physical computing projects that are fun for students to do they've got an element of craziness with them um i've really experimented with what can i connect the raspberry pi to um, something that I've been talking to Andrew Robinson about is the analog to digital conversion so that we can start looking at how we could use it for um, data logging, for example. Um, we can have sensors uh, perhaps to detect how the temperature changes in a classroom overnight. 
little things like that. So I'm constantly looking to see what else can I connect this to. So I think it's really all about engaging young people and making sure that whatever we do, it's fun. Uh, somebody mentioned about you know restrictions on networks. Um, we have a network at school that's really, really tied down for our students. And so teaching networks are a bit of a pain because there's so little that the students can actually access and do. But with Raspberry Pi, that's not true. Um, our internet is filtered. Uh, we use a smooth wall um, firewall, so the internet's filtered anyway. So as far as our techs are concerned, they don't mind uh, devices connecting to the Wi-Fi network, um, they don't particularly want us plugging things in, but they don't mind wireless connectivity, um, but the URLs are filtered anyway, so that's not necessarily a problem. We also operi uh, operate a BYOD policy, which I know is quite, it's quite go-ahead, but our Wi-Fi seems to be holding up quite nicely. Anybody else on the panel? Um, I think People like Pi Maroney, he's, he's, he's made the Pi Bow and it's absolutely fantastic and that's really engaging because one thing that teachers were frightened of when they saw, speaking as a teacher, um, when they saw the Raspberry Pi was, God, kids will destroy it very quickly and they'll pull bits off it, they'll drop it, they'll do all sorts and it's not practical. I honestly didn't really think that my students would probably do that because they're far too fascinated by it to destroy it. But some, some do and teachers frightened of anything that's easily breakable so things like the the, the pie bow protecting it and putting those into school as well as the raspberry pies to give teachers more confidence in actually using them in a classroom environment would be fantastic but like chris said budget yeah the raspberry pie is cheap but at the same time i actually for next year haven't really got a budget that's how bad things are so getting things into schools from you know the Raspberry Pi Foundation from that perspective, but we also need the the other hardware and the other bits of equipment, the protective cases as well. And hence me saying I'd like to be able to provide those to my students who want them at a discounted rate through the school, VAT free. And Karen. Yeah. And what is Raspberry Pi is unusual uh, uh, piece of uh, card because it don't destroy so easy. I have um, dropped uh, the Raspberry Pi in the ground and the floor, don't break. I know a woman, I don't know if it's you, who wash the Raspberry Pi and still work. Do it in the dry drum, but it still work. So it's not so easy to destroy, actually, and that is really, really nice. And I think one other g good thing with Raspberry Pi is the hard work always work. It's no problem with the hard work. So if you only have to uh, get your NUD on the soft work and soft um, wear instead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And sorry. Oh, you can add something, Clive, yeah. yeah. Um, I, th I think we need to, um, that's a bit loud. I think we need to share. And the whole thing is, um, is uh, there's nothing better you can give to me as a teacher than uh, a little pack, probably about this thick, with a scheme of working. We're full of lesson plans and full of worksheets and full of fantastic um, things. So we need, you know, if we create these things as teachers, we've got to share them. Um, we're looking at how to do that. One way at the moment is we've got an education section on the forum. It's fairly undeveloped at the moment. We're going to be developing that, pushing that, and making it a, a sort of place for um, teachers and educators to hang out and to share ideas and resources and to get together and to, you know, just, just hang out and, and, and um, create stuff for use in the classroom. And this to, just to make teachers comfortable with using the, the pie. Um, I'm looking at the ge these guys over here. I hope they're not sending um, inappropriate tweets to, to your, qu your questions, Alan. They've got that look on their face. I think. So we've, got, we've actually got three teachers on the platform and somebody who's not a teacher. And this question's come from Raspberry Pi beginners. And the question is, what focus can education give to students to help them get ready for industry? Now, Karen, you're a web developer. So I wonder if we could start with you. So how can the Raspberry Pi help children prepare for industry? And sorry, there's another bit to the question. Should we be teaching practical over the academic? It should be uh, practical, <laughs> absolutely. One of the reasons that so few um, a woman is in uh, the ET industry we is because... So few women working in IT. Yes, yeah, so it's a yeah. little too uh, academic education for today. Um, 
for just one very, very, very easy thing, but it's a big, huge uh, mountain if you don't know it. It's something, you, oh, many people say, catch the flash. And if you don't know how, how should you do it? It's control F5, but it's so simple. But if you don't know it, it's a mountain, a big mountain. And, and many people who, n who get in the IT and uh, do it uh, 30 years, it's so simple, so they forgot it is how to do it. So uh, they tell you how to so do it. So people take it for granted yes, that they think that it's easy. Yes, very much. But this new th Raspberry Pi, nothing is granted any longer, so it's good. And they use that uh, the hardware is uh, so uh, uh, robust, it's good. Anybody so you else know it's not panel? that a problem. Should yeah. So should we be focusing on the practical over the academic? I think it's got to be a mix of both. Because I think if students are just playing and they don't really know what they're doing, um, that's a problem. And unfortunately, our whole education system involves us teaching students them trying new skills and then actually being assessed on them. So unfortunately, I think the exam system's here to stay. And what goes along with that is the academic rigor. And part of my role, um, I am a teacher, of course, but I am a developer also for OCR. And I'm mindful that we're, we're trying to assess students as well as, as teach them new skills. So unfortunately, the academic rigor's got to be there. Um, whether we like it or not, the government measure the performance of schools on the number of uh, A stars to C in GCSE level that their students get. And while that remains, we do have to, we do have to assess our students. But one other thing I would say is that there is this thing, this, this joy of learning and, and I'm ancient, and I love learning new things. And I know that, that, that other students feel exactly the same. It's a wow when you've got something to work. You know, when you've been slaving away at it, and then suddenly your program compiles, and it works, and it runs, and it does what you intended it to do. So there's that real sense of joy that you've overcome a hurdle. But at the same time, you're actually learning. And so when we come back to the academic rigor, Yes, we are teaching these kids some academic skills. The, the persistence to stick with something, the resilience to stay with something when, when it goes wrong. They're learning new skills all the time. So I think it's really difficult to separate what is academic learning from practical activity. Because as soon as you undertake practical activity, you're learning something. Is that academic? I'll leave you to decide. So. Yeah, just, just quickly, I, I think um, mess about from an early age and, and break things and, and um, experiment and have fun. There, there's no need at all to, 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 uh, um, to inflict academic rigor on young children. They should be having a bit of fun. Of course, you get to key stage four and we need to assess. There's not uh, really any way around that at the moment. But um, certainly, the, y y why should we pull apart this this having fun and creating from the academic rigor. I think BCS tested the academic rigor of, of one of the uh, com GCSE computing courses recently and it came out as more um, rigorous than physics. Um, at the same time, I can go along and do that course and have fun and create and, and make a fantastic project and, and do quite cool things. So I don't think we need to pull them apart. Okay, so we've got a question from Dave, who's Dave G 3 on Twitter. He says, the draft computing curriculum, so in England, a new They've come up with a proposal for a new curriculum for computing. It starts from key stage one, which is age five. Do you think that the government, the DFE, is being too optimistic? And what support do you think that Raspberry Pi can provide to children as young as five years old? I, I think we patronise the younger kids at the moment, and we think, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't actually have them doing anything computational. And we're not talking about coding talking about computational thinking, so we can go out in the, in, in the playground and you know, if, if I do a training day with teachers, you, you spend half the day without a computer because you go out with a um, bit of chalk and string and um, you know, flashcards. It, it's, it's a way of thinking. So if you talk about algorithms, the word algorithms mentioned in that draft proposal, 
and then it kind of freaks teachers out. Um, you know, at the age of five, six, you should know what an algorithm is. It's just, you know, it's just a way of breaking down a problem and then solving a problem in a series of steps. But that's making a sandwich. Okay, so when you teach that, you just teach them how to make a sandwich and we do an algorithm for that. So I, I think it's the adults that are really probably got a problem with, with this at the moment. The kids certainly don't have a problem with that, I don't think. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, unfortunately, with my kids, they've um, had to grow up being surrounded by tech and they better get used to it. So my son, from when he was three, would play simple games on a computer. You know, and... and He's learning, if I go through that door, something happens. If I go through this door, something else happens. If I click on that red spot, I get a different outcome. It's all about problem solving and learning routines and learning structure. And I think that's really important. And I'm quite excited to be involved with our local primary schools. I delivered some CPD quite, res quite recently. Um, and I did a sort of CS Unplugged type session. And we did all sorts of different things. And I said to them afterwards, I said, could you imagine doing this with Key Stage 1? Because even though I'd aimed it primarily at Key Stage 2, some of the activities would have transferred quite well. Um, and they said, yeah, yeah, I think so. So I'd recommend you having a look at the CS Unplugged website, if you haven't had a look at that. Lots and lots of activities there. Um, was there a Raspberry Pi focus to this? I think there was, wasn't there? Yeah, so, you know, I guess get your older kids to develop some programs that the tinies could actually use. That would be a really great project, wouldn't it? Actually get your older kids to produce some programs, go out to the primary school and see if they have fun with them. Um, my son's six um, and he uses uh, a B-Bot in school and he's already writing his own al algorithms. The fact that he doesn't know that what he's doing is constructing an algorithm doesn't mean anything and it doesn't yeah they know what an algorithm is he's solving a problem building a lego set that i've just bought him from tesco is solving a problem because he knows what he wants at the end of it and he's just got to get there and he's got to follow the instructions to get there um going down into school from the raspberry pi there's lego sets around the corner that would be easily accessible to primary schools if again if you know we could get those into primary schools and i think that's perfectly feasible there's lots of different ways in getting getting this kind of level of programming just using a raspberry pi and also in another room at the moment they're having the the robots going on and i've seen people who are here today simple sci um constructing with leds and things as well and fair enough you wouldn't expect necessarily a five-year-old to build that but actually to look at it and try and work out how it works. And I've seen a five-year-old construct um, a Lego Mindstorms robot, so I don't really accept that, no, they can't do it. I just think they need to be equipped and enabled to do it. So we've got a, we've got a loaded question here, and I'm going to come on to it. So this is from Miss Mo, who's at Miss Mo, Ask Miss Mo on Twitter. And she's... And I'm actually thinking that someone in the audience is going to be able to help us with this question as well. So she says, we're going to need more CPD for teachers, continuing professional development and programming so for teachers who are traditional ICT teachers. And I was thinking yesterday, Karen was telling me there's a, there's a teacher in a school near her. Karen's not a teacher, but she wants to support them. This question is, who's going to be addressing this issue? Who's going to be helping and making sure that teachers are at up to the point where they can confidently teach this but I'm also going to ask one of our audience to step forward as well and oh, yeah, yeah go Mark's on um, well I'm my, t my school is a lead school with the network of excellence and Mark's just standing up and I'm sure he's going to tell us all about the network of excellence and like Alan is a master teacher and currently in Preston I've contacted our eight feeder primary schools to ask them what support they need and as a lead school and involved in the computer at school network I'm taking the responsibility to actually to help coordinate or deliver what I can in terms of CPD for those teachers and there's there's no money out there we all know that but then again there's foundations like computing at school the lead schools the network of excellence Raspberry Pi OCR who are providing that CPD and it, it is available we just need to coordinate where it's needed and what is needed hello Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Dawling, and um, I'm the national CPD coordinator for Computing at School. 
which is the Subjects Association for Computer Science. The reason I'm talking to you is because um, I've bes been seconded for a year to work for computing at school, three days a week. I'm a classroom teacher like you, uh, many of you. I work in primary and I work in secondary. And we've set up something called the Network of Excellence. So what is that? The Network of Excellence is a group of schools that have got together to say we would like to work together to develop computing in schools. So we've got schools that say, put their hands up and say, help, we don't know what to do. Can you help us? And then we've got schools like colleagues on the stage here that put their hands up and say, do you know something? We're pretty good at this already and we'd quite like to help. And our head teacher would like us to help because we're an academy and therefore under our agreement with the DfE, we actually need to support other schools to maintain our funding at the end of the seven years. So we set up something called the Network of Excellence, as I say, and then we went to the universities and we said, would you please help? And the university said, well, what's in it for us? And we said, well, you need to uh, support your local community to get the best students, get your teachers to come and work with you. Obviously, students can't afford to go away now to study, so they, you, know, you, you need to you've got a smaller pool to attract. So the result of this is that we've now got over 700 schools in England that have signed up to work together. Over 130 of these schools have stood up and said, yes, we would like to help and we've got 80 universities that have actually also put their hands up. Now we have had some small amount of funding from the Department for Education to do this, and I mean very, very small, seed funding. And what we've done is we've invested that in the front line with our teachers. Because we're a grassroots organisation, it isn't a hierarchical thing with national strategies coming down from the top. It's two teachers who have been seconded to run the network of excellence, as well as a teaching job, are leading this for you, okay? So what we did was we employed 35 master teachers in England, which, okay, isn't enough, but do you know something? It was a start. And we gave their school some money to release them for an uh, equivalent of an afternoon a week to deliver CPD in their local communities. So what are they actually doing? Well, in the, um, this term, since January to March, we've had 35 master teachers run over 70 events. Okay? And we're not um, charging the extortionate training fees that some, some organisations charge. We're doing it for £35 for an afternoon session, £70 for a day session, which suddenly makes it affordable. These people are the experts in our community. They have computer science backgrounds, they are outstanding teachers in their observations. Many of them are ASTs, so they are used to working with schools to help them improve. And this is just something that we're doing to support that relationship between organisations. At a more basic level, Computing at School has something called the CAS Online, which is a forum which you can join. It's free. You don't pay to join CAS. And we've got 3,000 members, and most of them contribute to CAS Online on a regular basis. And there are forums that you can come along and you can literally just type in a question and somebody will, will help you up and down the country. And this is about members supporting members. This is about, we've got forums for the southeast, the southwest, etc. And you can go on there and you can ask questions and you can link up and you can, as, as our colleagues have said, you know, you can work together. The final thing I'd like to share with you is the CAS hubs. We have 45 of these. These are run by teachers, academics, industry people. Industry people do go to the CAS hubs and offer their support. Because somebody asked a question about how do I get involved, how do I support my local teacher? So we've got 45 of them nationally. They meet every half term to term. Alan's a hub leader, and for example, Chris is one of our master teachers, people in the room here that actually are contributing. And they get together and they buy some jam donuts and that sort of thing, and a few teas, coffees, cakes. Sometimes they have a, a guest speaker like myself come along or somebody from industry, or I'm looking around, we've got the, the, the code club in the room and we've got all different organizations. And they come along and they talk about what they're doing. My final message is, if you're in the room and you're interested in supporting your local school, don't walk away today and think, actually, no, it's not really for me. There's a lady in the room, or should be in the room, her name's Dawn, and she's from Edge Hill University, and later on today, she's going to be doing a talk about roots in... Ah, there she is. Everyone look at Dawn. She's waving. Okay, excellent. She's going to be doing a talk, just a very short one, in one of the rooms um, outside in the foyer, about how to, how to enter into a teaching career. So she, there's five or six routes, and she's going to give you the uh, overview and the benefits and the uh, disadvantages of each route.
The final thing is that we have STEM ambassadors and they will do all the CRB checks for you. They will support you with finding a local school who would also like your help. So the, uh, the, the uh, CAS uh, kind of uh, motto, I guess, or it's not a motto, but saying is there is no them, there is only us. So if you spot a problem, if you want to help, just get involved. Somebody needs your help out there. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry I've gate crashed. That's, that's, no, that's good. You're welcome. Because we haven't mentioned computing at school a lot today, but it is... It's what they've achieved in the last 12 months has been significant and uh, if you're not already a member you don't have to be a teacher you just have to be interested in computing at school now i think we've possibly got time for one final question we might fit a second one in which is if you're going to actually sit down with a child and teach them how to do something with a raspberry pi where would you start what would you do first with them Okay, uh, that's better. Um, yeah, where to start? There's so many different routes in. I think I would say start with something familiar. Start with what they know. Um, I have a Raspberry Pi on the OCR stand that has a full office suite on it. So people say, oh, you can't do word processing on that. Yes, you can. Uh, you haven't got a graphics package on that. Yes, I have. Stick with what they know. Get them playing some games. Um, one of the things I've done with my students is, is get them playing some games using the Raspberry Pi and then evaluate those games. There's a set of Pi game games that you get. If you do the standard Raspbian install, you get some Pi games and you can get your students playing those games and then they can critique them. And they can say, oh, this one's too easy. This one's too hard. I don't like the colours on this one. So change it. And they start to learn that they can make small changes in the code without having to write a whole program. And it brings about a change in the game. So we had all different color wormies crawling around the screen and different color flippies. And those of you that have a Raspberry Pi and have played the Pi games will know what I'm talking about. Um, also, lots of students learn Scratch. Scratch is one of the languages that you can program the Raspberry Pi in. So make use of what students know already. Get them onto familiar territory first, and then you can introduce some of the other fantastic things. Um, I have been using a PyFace uh, interface board, which I must say, with my students in school, is absolutely fantastic. Very robust, um, and opens up a wealth of possibilities, because then you can do a lot more um, connecting to uh, differently powered devices, for example, motors. So I've got my crazy Lego robot on the OCR stand. So it just keeps on growing and growing and growing. So my advice would be start with the familiar. Start with what students know already. Show them that this really is just a smaller computer and then build upon that. Once you've got their confidence, build upon it. But in my experience, kids love to play and they'll find out stuff anyway. So let them play. Thanks. Um, for me, it's got to be, um, if I had five minutes to get to, to, to really show a child how, how cool this little tool is, how creative it is, for me, it's got to be physical computing. And so um, I'd maybe start with something familiar. I'd start with something a bit nuts and a bit m kind of mental. And, and if I was showing a six-year-old boy um, the Raspberry Pi, it would be Green Jelly Baby, get a little marker, make him into a creeper, stick an LED up his bum, and um, we've got Flashing Creeper from Minecraft. I mean, it's got, got to really engage them. And then we can sort of move on and you know, do scratch, and we can do all the CS stuff and, and more fun stuff. But I just really engage them. It's got to be uh, physical computing for me. It's fantastic, engaging, and, and just really good fun. One thing that I think my students need to know, first of all, is how to set it up. Because I'm talking about secondary school students here, and they are very used to computers being in shiny boxes um, and having casing, and they can't see anything else. They don't, they don't necessarily know, you know how the in operating system gets on there, first of all, and we'll putting it all together. And I'd like to, I would like to be able to teach a class of students how to set up the Raspberry Pi and even loading on the operating system onto their SD cards as well. But that's obviously for the older ones. I want to say play is a very good start. Uh, my stepson is seven years old.